KCRG TV9 and KCRG.com. Now, your first alert forecast with meteorologist Kai O'Mara. Our weather conditions continue to look great here for the rest of the afternoon. Lows tonight not nearly as cool as last night. We stay clear overall. Southeast winds 5 to 15. Plan on lows tonight to fall back into the 50s. Tomorrow it'll be a warm and windy day. There's your wind gust forecast hour by hour. You can see they'll be gusty from the southwest tomorrow afternoon. Some of those peak gusts will be around 30 to 35 miles an hour. From KCRG TV 9, KYOU, and the Gazette, this is the Iowa 2nd Congressional District Debate. Your voice, your vote. Good evening. Welcome to the 2nd Congressional District Debate here in the KCRG TV 9 studios here in Cedar Rapids. This is the first of a two-part set of debates with our sister stations, KWQC in the Quad Cities and KYOU in Ottumwa, also partnering with the Gazette in Cedar Rapids and the Quad City Times. The next debate will be next Thursday, October the 15th. KWQC will host that one, and they will also focus on a few different topics and what we will tonight, such as education and some of the other topics, but still, we've got plenty of subjects to work our way through for the next hour. I'm Chris Searle with KCRG TV9 here in Cedar Rapids. Also joined by James Lynch, longtime political reporter with the Gazette in Cedar Rapids, also to serve as moderators tonight. And because of the pandemic, we are without an audience. We are trying to keep a social distance here with the candidates. And now it's time to meet our two candidates for the second district of Congress. First, Democrat Rita Hart is a former teacher and also served as Iowa State Senator in the 49th District for six years, covering Clinton and Scott counties. And on the right, Republican Marionette Miller Meek current state senator in the 41st district, ophthalmologist from Ottumwa. Thank you both for joining us tonight. We appreciate it. Senator Hart, you won the coin flip, so you get to lead us off for 60 seconds to talk about why you're the best choice for this seat in Congress. Well, thank you so much, and it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm Rita Hart. I'm a former teacher, a farmer, and a lifelong rural Iowan. I grew up on a dairy farm outside of Charles City, Iowa, with a with a Democratic father and a Republican mother and eight brothers and sisters who had a lively caucus at our dinner table every night. That's where I learned how to stand up for what I believe. It's also where I learned that good ideas come from people that you don't agree with. And I took that lesson into the classroom and I taught in rural, rural schools for over 20 years and, uh, took, and also took that to the State Senate where I worked with my Republican and Democratic colleagues on important issues like economic development. Now, I know we're not going to agree on every issue here tonight, but I want to go to Washington to find common ground. We're facing some really tough problems right now with the pandemic, with the economy, with health care, and with education, many more. I know that the way to get to the best solutions is to do it together. Now, Senator Miller Meek, 60 seconds for you. Well, thank you very much. And I'd like to thank uh, KCRG and Cedar Rapids Gazette for hosting this. Um, I'm Marionette Miller Meeks, uh, congressional candidate for Iowa's 2nd Congressional District. My father was a master sergeant in the Air Force. My mother had gotten a GED. No one in my family had ever been college educated, although they valued education tremendously. When I was 15, I was severely burned in a kitchen fire, and during that very long hospitalization, I had an epiphany about my future. I was going to become a doctor. So I left home at 16, got a job. I enrolled in San Antonio Junior College. I enlisted in the Army at age 18, and I continued to work and go to school until I got a degree in nursing, a master's in education, and ultimately was able to go to medical school. And then I came to Iowa to do my residency in ophthalmology at one of the best programs in the country. And now I'm an Iowa State Senator. I served 24 years in the military, never having given up on serving my country. That tenacity, that grit, that resilience, is not my story alone. It is the story of countless Iowans that I meet every single day. And I had the pleasure and the privilege of serving them in the state Senate and working on things like health care, access to health care, lowering prescription drug prices. And I got awards as a senator, which I wasn't expecting. And I think that we can take that same spirit, that same tenacity to Washington, D.C. to work for you, whether it be on recovering from this pandemic and preparing for the next one, economic growth that allows all of us to fulfill our potential, uh, but also working on important issues such as how we uh, defend our country and then what do we do about all of our uh, programs that we know that we need to fund through economic growth. 
Thank you both for those opening statements. Now let's delve a little bit further into the experiences that both of you have had within politics. Senator Rita Hart ran as Lieutenant Governor alongside Fred Hubble two years ago. Senator Miller Meeks also has run for the second district numerous times. So a question for each of you. What have the th both of you learned from being on those respective political stages for campaigning, sometimes statewide or having already gone through this district to try to capture it? We'll start with Senator Miller Meeks. What have you learned from your previous runs for the second district? I think one of the things that you learn the most is to be yourself and to be authentic and be sincere. So remain the person that you are. So in meeting with people, speaking with them, listening to them, addressing their problems. And I certainly saw that in the state Senate. Some of the best bills that I authored in the state Senate were from problems that people brought to me and asked me to address for them, such as uh, passing a legislation asking for a waiver from CMS. Uh, for the five-year eligibility to get prenatal care for lawful permanent residents, uh, pres uh, prescription uh, uh, drug prices, um, a bill that looking at pharmacy benefit managers, and then also um, oral contraceptives over the counter for those over age 18 with proper um, counseling and proper screening. I, and those, all those bills came out of listening to people and bringing forth their problems to work on the state Senate. We also passed bills on broadband this session, um, and we had a successful session even through a pandemic. So I think being yourself, being authentic, being willing to listen, but not just listen, but listen with your heart and your brain and your ears, and then act upon what it is that you hear. And now, Senator Hart, what did you pick up from two years ago when you ran on the Democratic ticket for governor as lieutenant governor with Fred Hubble? Because that's much larger than this district going statewide for that campaign. What did you pick up from that? It was a great experience. You know, I got to travel all across the state and uh, talk to so many people um, in, in various little corners of the state. It was, a, it was really a great experience. And, and I would ag agree with Senator Miller Meeks that the important thing is that you're listening because uh, you can learn so much from people. You know, we all come from a different place. We all have a different story to tell. And every time you take the time to really listen to people, then you, you come away a little wiser and uh, you're able to, um, to then go after the, the uh, kinds of solutions that can really make a difference. I learned that, um, st that uh, lesson throughout my Senate campaigns as well. Um, and, and serving as a state senator, that the important things that you do is to really get out there, to show up, um, and to uh, have some important conversations, and, and to learn every single time through someone else's story um, what, what the important takeaways are, and, and then, then care enough to um, bring people together um, to um, do something that's going to make people's lives better. Senator Hart, we're coming back to you with a question about COVID-19 relief, pandemic relief. We seem to be getting conflicting signals uh, on what's next, whether there'll be another round of COVID relief before the election. Can, first, can Iowans wait until after the election for more COVID relief? And what should be included in the next phase of, the, of pandemic relief? Yeah, so this is so disappointing because yes, the, the uh, pandemic is, is still here. Um, we, we are still fighting um, to get to a better place, and in the process, people are suffering. And so, um, you know, it was, it's disappointing that we're at this stage where we are when we know that um, Washington can come together and get something done, right? They did that with the first, uh, first um, relief bill that was passed, so we know that they can do it. And the fact that it's not getting done in a timely fashion is very disappointing. People are still suffering. We have unemployed people through no fault of their own. If they can't pay their bills, they can't pay their rent, then landowners are going to have to evict and we're going to have more people on the homeless, in the homelessness pop, homeless population. We know that certain sectors of the economy are hurt worse. The, the um, retail industry, the hospitality industry, these people need some assistance. We don't want our cities and our counties to, go, to, go, um, to have to cut our services or to, to lay off uh, police, fighter, police officers or firefighters. Um, we need this relief now. We know that it can be done. It's really disappointing that we don't get it done because it needs to be done now. Thank you. And, and Senator Miller Meeks, the same question to you. What should be included? Do we need more supplemental unemployment uh, compensation, another round of PPP for businesses? What would you include in the next round? Well, it is disappointing uh, that at this point in time, there seems to be a hiatus uh, in negotiations. When we went into pause at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, as a state senator, um, I uh, did not have the luxury of uh, staying in a household. 
Um, I was out with my constituents uh, trying to help people navigate through getting a stimulus check if they hadn't received it, getting unemployment, um, and especially for people like school bus drivers, uh, which you wouldn't think about uh, needing uh, additional unemployment, um, and helping uh, companies and businesses and small businesses to get uh, PPP, um, trying to keep businesses alive in your small town when it's so hard to have a good restaurant. And so navigating through all of that, you really saw people suffer. I've had uh, my, uh, one of our good friends, uh, father died uh, just recently uh, after contracting COVID-19. So that has been extraordinarily difficult for everyone. I volunteered for my hospitals in my Senate district should they have a surge. So it is disappointing that we are not having another uh, phase four. Um, I would call it a recovery or a repair rather than a stimulus. And yes, it should include additional um, uh, PPP. It should include additional unemployment uh, because there are people suffering. And we need to look at uh, do we have to do anything to facilitate stat SNAP benefits at this time because of food insecurity and lack of food. Um, and we know that there had been a pause on evictions and moratoriums, but that will have to end. Growing our economy is so important that we open up our economy so we can solve some of these problems and then getting a vaccine so that we can get through this pandemic and then prepare for the next pandemic. So yes, it's disappointing, but honestly, um, you, you can't expect the, the taxpayers of Iowa to bail out Illinois or New York or California for their poor fiscal practices. We had great conservative fiscal practices in Iowa the past three years, and that's allowed our state to weather the pandemic better than most states. Senator Miller Meeks, I'm going to let Senator Hart have a little bit more time, about 45 <laughs> seconds to a minute to kind of respond to this. Anything that you heard from Senator Miller Meeks or maybe something you want to underscore for how you think a federal response for a stimulus amid the pandemic should result. Yeah, so, so again, um, we know that this can be done if people put their minds to it and recognize how greatly it is needed. Um, so again, yeah, the small businesses would be another example that I think is so crucial to rural Iowa. I was um, in Fort Madison uh, the other day and talked to a gentleman who's, who um, has a diner there whose um, family has had it for generations. And he's struggling to keep it going, and therefore he's struggling to keep workers there. Um, and that's a, a huge problem. And he said that several of the businesses in the downtown area were not gonna be able to open up. And I think the Restaurant Association has said that so many businesses are gonna close down and never be able to open again. We've gotta get this relief package passed now. We'll now shift to mask mandates. This came up in the first debates for the second district with the two of you. But the storyline has changed since then. The president tested positive for for coronavirus one week ago. We're still seeing the narrative over wearing masks in public, some states and cities not requiring it. Senator Hart, you said listen to the scientists in the last debate. Senator Miller Meeks, you said that the U.S. does not need a federal government mask mandate. Do either of you have different thoughts on this since the president's test, the positive test last week? For this one, we'll start out with Senator Miller Meeks. Has anything changed for you on this? Well, I think COVID-19 has proven to be, uh, the, or the SARS-CoV-2 virus has proven to be a very resilient uh, virus, one that was unexpected and unanticipated. Most uh, viruses like influenza or the coronaviruses that cause the common flu go away and they're seasonal in nature. But COVID-19 has been very resilient and been somewhat unpredictable in how it has uh, remained in, and stayed on. Um, I certainly um, wear a mask. I socially distance. I wash my hands. I use hand sanitizer. It's clipped to my purse. Um, I also uh, recommend that for other people to do. I think within our state, uh, the attorney general, the Democrat attorney general said that a mask uh, mandate would not be enforceable, would be difficult to enforce. And we have to wonder, are we going to arrest people or find people if they're not wearing a mask. But all of us can do our part and should do our part. So if we cannot socially distance, uh, then we should wear a mask. Uh, we should avoid uh, being in large groups and contact with large groups, wash our hands. If you're sick, don't go out and don't go in large groups. And I think those simple things all of us can do to make it better for everyone else. And certainly it's unfortunate uh, that the president uh, contracted COVID-19. But honestly, when you look at what was happening throughout the world, I think that um, this was going to be a virus that was going to infect a large number of people. And we know that this uh, shutting down an economy does not come without risk. The CDC has already said that 98, over 98,000 people had non-COVID related deaths because of uh, hospitalization, hospitals that were closed down for non-essential services, be they cardiovascular events, diabetes, um, and, and death rates from suicide, overdose, drug addictions. So this is not a simple answer, shut down everything so that the virus will go away. So um, hopefully the vaccine will be available soon, safe and effective and approved.
Thank you, Senator. Senator Hart, I'll give you up to two minutes uh, if you want to handle this question as well. We're trying to keep it to 60 seconds, but I'm also not going to jump in right away if there's a, a thought going on for this. So, but <laughs> okay, please, you have up to two minutes. Sure, I appreciate that. And, you know, I, this is, uh, the question was not about closing down the economy. The question was about should we be using, should we be doing the things that we know we have to do to protect the public? And if we do that, will that allow us to keep this economy going? And I think that's the bottom line, is that until we get this infection rate down, we're going to struggle with this economy, and it actually will be worse if we don't do that. So it is disappointing that we're not following the science on this. Um, you know, we can talk about how we're, we're following um, the, the mask um, suggestions and the washing of the hands and that, that kind of thing, but the fact is um, that uh, Senator Miller-Meeks, you stood on the Senate floor and told your Senate colleagues that they did not need to wear a mask. We've known Excuse from the me, very beginning. Excuse me, I said you did not need to wear a mask if you were socially distanced. I read the CDC guidelines. So the CDC guidelines specifically say if you cannot physically separate, then wear a mask. But Those think, are the CDC guidelines. But I think guidelines. also that, it, that it's really important that as, as um, leaders here that, that we are providing a great example. And, when we, and we know that when we're indoors, the risks are much higher. And so, so the bottom line is we've got to come together and quit making this a political thing and instead take advantage of the opportunity to bring people together on this. You know, it's what we, have, what we did in the derecho. You know, we, hit, we got hit on, my, on our farm pretty hard with the derecho, and our families, our friends, our neighbors all came together. It wasn't, nobody asked about Republican or Democrat because there was a common problem. That's what we have here with the COVID crisis, is a common problem, and we lost an opportunity to bring people together on it and follow the science and bring down this, this uh, infection rate so that we're doing a better job. We can see that that's not worked well when the United States is compared to other countries and where this state is compared to other states. So we can do better, but we've got to bring pe people together to do it. Well, no one oh. in the legislative session came down with COVID-19. Moving along, uh, let's talk about uh, an issue that in the midst of the pandemic has come up, and that's the social justice, social inequities. Um, we saw this in June with the demonstrations in Iowa City and the Quad Cities and elsewhere after George Floyd's death. And I want to ask you both, um, what's the federal role in resolving this, in, in addressing social justice inequities? Um, or is there a federal role, or should it be left to the states? And we go first to... This will be for Senator Hart. Senator Hart, yes. Yeah, so this has been um, an issue that, again, has uh, divided the country. And, um, and, and it's uh, an important issue that we've got to, again, address correctly. Um, as, as far as uh, looking at what can really make a difference, we've got to start with listening first, right? We've got to bring people to the table. Um, who, um, who have been most affected by this. And, and, and uh, so that's why I spent some time talking to uh, the chief of police in Davenport, Paul Sikorsky, about this and his approach and, uh, and my um, uh, local sheriff, Rick Lincoln. Um, they talk about the same thing that we have to do, which I think everywhere, which is bring people together, uh, um, the, share, the, the stakeholders here, the, the NAACP, the Black Lives Matter um, leaders, the, the um, social agencies, the, the um, entire um, group of people that can really address the situation. Talk about it, figure out what kinds of steps we can take that will really make a difference. And uh, that's the approach that I'd like to see at the federal level as well. Senator Miller-Meeks, again, the federal role in resolving this, um, for example, should police be required to wear body cameras? Uh, should we get rid of qualified immunity for police officers who are bad actors? Well, um, this has been something that has uh, roiled our country. And first, I'd like to say that as we continue uh, to address the challenge of racial inequality, we shouldn't rush to racial hatred. So all of us, I think, working together, this is a problem that we can solve. When we went back into the legislative session, this was very soon after the tragic, horrific uh, death of George Floyd, 
uh, we acted very quickly as a legislative body in a bipartisan way, bringing people together uh, to enact police reform. We also did this in concert with our law enforcement and the members of our um, legislative body that happened to be in law enforcement. So we enacted banning on choke holes. Uh, we allowed the uh, state attorney general to bring charges against a police officer, um, implicit bias training to expand upon explicit bias training, and also to prevent police officers from being routed around to other rural uh, police departments uh, so that they would avoid um, uh, prosecution or, um, uh, or uh, recriminations uh, for their behavior and their conduct. So they're not allowed to just continue to, to go to other places uh, and be bad actors. So we did that at a, at a state level. We also, um, Senator, myself- Senator, we're at time on this one. So shifting out of partisanship, we always hear about this, especially during the election campaigns of how people are gonna work across the aisle. I'm gonna ask a question of each of you, does not necessarily require a response in it, but specifically to your own candidacy. We'll start with Senator Miller Meeks. Where do you break from President Trump on? Is there anything that people might associate with President Trump as they're voting that you're hoping they don't associate with you on Election Day? Is there anything specific that you differ from our president on? Well, I think the, uh, uh, the um, event at the Rose Garden recently uh, with the uh, nomination of Amy Cohn and Barrett could have been handled differently. I don't know all of the things that happened there. I don't know if they temperature checked people, if they had COVID-19 testing or screening, but I do think that uh, it was a momentous occasion, but at the same point in time, given that we're in a pandemic, there should have been appropriate social distancing and physical separation and mask wearing at that event. Uh, so that would be one place where I would be uh, uh, at odds with uh, uh, President Trump, and I wish he'd tweet less. Okay. <laughs> now, Senator Hart, a question for you. Since this district was redrawn a decade ago, Dave Lopesack has been in office. He's closing out 14 years, seven terms. If people see your name on there, is a vote for you a vote for his eighth term? Is there anything you would split with Congressman Lopesack on from his own record or other Democrats? Yeah, no, so I, I do think that, uh, that Dave Lopesack did a great job of representing um, this district. But I think also you're going to see that um, I'm a much different person than Dave Lopesack. Uh, my background is different. I'm, I, ha I come from a rural um, perspective. I, I understand uh, f the farming um, aspects, and I, I lived my entire life in rural Iowa. I think it's so important that uh, we work on economic development issues for small towns, for rural areas, and I can have those kinds of conversations, and um, I, I look forward to that. And, and to the, the particular question you're asking, is there areas of disagreement? Absolutely. I think that uh, that's the thing I like about the Democratic Party is that it's a very big umbrella and we don't always agree on issues. And so, so for instance, um, I come from a, um, um, an area of, of agriculture where I think that there are specific things that we ought to be doing to create um, a strategic plan to take us from where we are now on, on uh, water quality and uh, climate change, um, carbon sequestration, to get to where we need to go. And so I don't always agree with the attack that some of my Democratic colleagues do. We'll touch on some of those uh, farm and agricultural issues a little bit later on. Shifting up to derecho recovery, uh, in, one of, in the first and only debate we've seen so far out of the first district, Congresswoman Abby Finkenauer talked about trying to get some of the non-covered costs into a relief package like tree damage. That's costing some people in Cedar Rapids and other places thousands of dollars out of pocket. And the second district didn't take on as much property damage, of course, but there is ag damage, especially crop damage with some of the farmers. For either of you, and we'll start with Senator Hart, is there anything else that each of you would propose that would be financial relief for people who have suffered financial loss from the derecho? Senator Hart. Well, first of all, I would say that um, we suffered more um, loss in the second district than you might think. <laughs> you know, we got hit very hard on our farm. We, we lost um, every building that we have to store equipment in, and we lost three grain bins. And, and, it's gonna cre and we've got a lot of our crop down on the ground, and it's going to be a really tough harvest. And I think that's something that people haven't talked uh, much about, is how this uh, derecho uh, the pain of the derecho is continuing because there are a lot of farmers that are out there working tonight, like my husband, um, who are going to have, who are facing a really tough harvest and some really tough situations where they don't have grain storage, etc. And so I was disappointed that it took too long for Clinton County to get the relief that they did, that they needed. I see they just finally got that. 
Um, we've got, um, I think that there's a, a way to maybe um, look at that to speed up that kind of relief that's so important. But um, to, the, to your point also about the trees, I think that is, the, that is a huge loss to us as the state of Iowa. The thousands and thousands of trees that we have lost across the state. I think that there's definitely some work we need to do in that area as well. Senator Miller Meeks, your response on this question on uh, derecho and trying to maybe make some people whole that might not be covered on certain costs. I think there are certain costs that could be covered and uh, you know the derecho is uh, sort of like one of those things straws that break the camel back after the pandemic. It's been a very tumultuous and difficult year for for all of us and for Iowa especially and uh, Iowa's uh, farmers. So I think but there are other things in uh, more uh, urban areas, uh, the loss of food, the storage of food, uh, the um, getting the electricity back up. There were as we know that there were uh, Alliant and Mid-American, uh, there were other natural disasters in other places and uh, pe those, those equipment and trucks had to be brought back into the state. Uh, so looking at uh, our electric infrastructure, our electric grids and how we can handle that in the next uh, event, natural disaster that comes along is important, but we know people lost a lot of food, uh, food that was stored and so replacing that, getting access to food, access to ice so that they could continue Senator, food. Senator, I have to cut you off here on this one, thank you. <laughs> Uh, Senator Miller Meeks, we'll start with you. Uh, second district residents, especially those around Scott and Johnson counties, probably enjoy access to some of the best health practitioners and facilities in the state. What about the folks in the other 22 counties of the second district? How do you ensure they have access, especially during a pandemic? And, and specifically, we've seen a lot of greater use of telehealth, telemedicine. Is that the answer? And, and if it's the answer, does the second district have the bandwidth to make it available to everyone? Well, it's interesting you would ask that because when we were, uh, the night we met to go into the pause, uh, one of the things I brought up to my caucus was that uh, we needed to have better access for telehealth, for insurance companies that did not uh, cover telehealth, that uh, they should cover telehealth and that increased uh, reimbursement for telehealth, knowing that this was going to be an issue going forward. Certainly in rural areas, uh, there uh, is difficulty uh, in our critical access hospitals with providers, uh, with the level of providers, with maternal care, and these are things that we're working on within the state legislature with our loan repayment programs, our J-1 visa programs. And we need to continue to do that, but also continue to uh, recognize the importance of telehealth and with uh, digital electronics cameras, uh, there are, we have access to telehealth uh, services much better than we used to uh, in the past. I also happen to pass a bill on broadband specifically because, and I think the pandemic underscored that better than anything else, we need to have better access to broadband. I'm in a rural area and I don't have good access to broadband. If there's a cloud in the sky, my connect activity goes down. So we did pass a bill on rural broadband and some of the COVID-19 money is, um, I understand, will be going to uh, broadband nature. So faster broadband for telework, telelearning uh, and telehealth is going to be extremely important now. Would you and jump in here, Senator? Senator Hart, uh, the same question to you. And I mean, out on the farm, you're not that far from the Quad Cities, but uh, you're rural. Do you yeah. have the broadband connectivity to talk to your doctor, feel confident that your doctor is, is seeing you and you're seeing him or her? And 30 seconds on a response. We're okay. To time. <laughs> okay. So yeah, uh, it's so important, important to us out in rural Iowa, right? We need to access to our rural hospitals. And yes, telehealth is a great advantage and, and I've, we've been able to utilize that. We're lucky we have good broadband because we have a local telephone company who made the investment. We, not, we need to make sure that everyone has that kind of high speed internet. And we have to recognize that healthcare is crucial to keeping people in rural Iowa. We have an elderly population that wants to stay in their homes. They need to have that kind of access to, to good health care. And it's, uh, it's so important that we have mental health care. And that's a huge problem across the state of Iowa. Keeping it with health care, uh, but looking at some of the attacks that we've seen, we'll start off with Senator Hart. Seen some of the criticism for your backing of one Republican bill in the legislature, one of, I believe, only four Democrats, which lack protections for applicants with pre-existing conditions. You talked about this then in the first debate, but often we see this in campaigns where that can often become a first impression. How do you want to respond to that when you've seen those criticisms about you? Yeah, so let's, let's be clear here. Let's talk about the facts, and that is that not one person um, lost their health care because of this bill. And the, and the reason I wrote, voted for that bill is because it was the only option on the table to help my constituents who needed that, knew, needed that bill to be passed because we have self-employed people, farmers, who did not qualify for the subsidies 
and who couldn't afford the high cost of the premiums. And so this bill allowed Farm Bureau to create a program that applied to just that niche of people. And so when I was faced with no other alternative, um, that is a, a, a vote that I took on behalf of my constituents. And I'll never, I'll never uh, regret a vote that helped out my constituents. And the, you know, that program exists today. We have people in our district that are on that program. And my question is, would, we, would, uh, would my opponent take that program away? 30 seconds to respond to that, Senator Miller-Meeks, if you'd like. I would say I have a long history of uh, coverage for pre-existing condition. My mother had a congenital heart disease. My older brother had an open heart and had surgery at two years of age. I wrote an article in 2009 about portability, which you brought up in one of your attack ads. And in that said that there has to be coverage for pre-existing conditions. The fact of the matter is the reality, you don't have to believe me, you can believe Fred Hubble, your running mate, who said that that bill would, not, uh, would deny coverage for pre-existing conditions. And there's only one person on this stage today that has voted to deny coverage for pre-existing conditions, and that's Rita Hart. You can respond to that. So again, I did not vote to deny anybody any kind of health care. Not one person was denied health care because of that plan. What it did do was give people in my district an opportunity to get insurance who would not otherwise have it. And I will never be sorry that I did something in favor of my constituents. Well, Fred Hubble said it did deny coverage and you agreed with him. Next question now for Senator Miller Meeks. When some people see the attack ads, against you, saying there's $300,000 plus dollars in donations from the healthcare industry. If that's a first impression that people might get of you as they're looking at this campaign, how do you want to respond if people might be seeing that? I would say you have to look at my FEC report and uh, there's no contributions from Wellmark or Humana or United Healthcare or Aetna or any of the other large uh, medical insurance companies. But I also have a Senate record. My Senate record shows that I passed legislation asking for a waiver of the five-year eligibility to get prenatal care for lawful permanent residents. I passed a bill aimed at lowering prescription drug prices. I passed a bill prohibiting the insurance companies from non-medical switching of medications without the initiation from your doctor. Um, I also uh, was given the 2019 Underserved Champion of the Year by the Iowa Primary Care Association, the Legislator of the Year by the um, Iowa Harm Reduction Coalition, specifically because I was doing things to reduce costs, get access to care, and get people the needed services that they desire and need. Senator Hart, if you would like to respond to that, you can for 30 seconds. Yeah, so again, here's the reality here is that um, that my opponent has, has consistently um, been in favor of repealing the ACA, which would take millions of people <clears throat> off their health insurance and would not hold in insurance companies um, accountable for pre-existing conditions. And, uh, and, and so that's where we differ. I think that we should take the, the health care program that we have today and improve it and not go backwards. And that's what I will continue to work on. Even last week at Ben Kiefer, River to River, I have never been in, form, uh, in favor of repeal. I have always said reform. James. Let's talk about rural broadband again as it would be part of a larger infrastructure package. And there's a lot of talk in Congress about doing something with infrastructure, roads, bridges, uh, all sorts of forms of transportation. What are the top priorities, Senator Hart, for the second district in terms of infrastructure? What do we need most and, and how do we get it? Yeah, so there's so many needs for infrastructure. You know, we, we um, as farmers, recognize that we need these locks and dams to be there for us for we, so that we can get our product to market. So I think that that is crucial. Um, we've been working on um, four-laning Highway 30 for a long time. We need some improvements there on these two-lane roads. Um, I think infrastructure is also um, our, our small schools, that we provide them with the proper funding so that we can have quality education. You know, people live a great life out in rural Iowa. You know, I'm, I'm so um, thrilled that, when, that people can see the beauty of rural Iowa and who want to live in rural Iowa, but they need resources, right? And th that infrastructure includes um, protecting our rural hospitals. It means having grocery stores. It also means childcare. Childcare should be considered as part of any infrastructure because when families are struggling to get the childcare that they need, and right now everyone is, particularly in this time of a pandemic, but we've got to have affordable and accessible childcare, and that's a very important part of our economy. Senator Miller Meeks. Well, I think in terms of priorities for uh, infrastructure package, what, are, what do you see as the greatest needs for the second district and how should we pay for that? 
I think uh, locks and dams on the Mississippi River are very important, both for our manufacturing and our agricultural economy, um, our highways and our bridges, and not just Highway 30, that's been a uh, long time struggling to be a four lane, but also Highway 2 down in southeast Iowa. Um, and then also broadband in our electric grid. I think all of that is part of infrastructure and needs to be addressed. And uh, the broadband, as we've already uh, discussed, we passed a bill uh, in order to get higher connectivity, better connectivity in rural areas. I live in a rural area. And during the pandemic, honestly, I've never been so happy to live in a rural area with, where that's less populated than during this pandemic. Uh, so all of those things need to be addressed and we need to have a bipartisan uh, uh, coalition and consensus to come up with how do we fund infrastructure going forward. We know that the revenues coming in from the gas tax are less, not just from the pandemic and people not driving as much, but also because of electric vehicles. And what we did in the, in the state Senate was to pass an increased registration fee on solely electric vehicles so that there, you could have some road use uh, money come in from that. Senator Hart, I wanted to come back to you and ask you about how do we pay for these infrastructure projects? Motor fuel taxes, as Senator Miller Meek said, uh, seems to be a declining source of revenue. What can we do? So again, we've got to um, recognize that things are changing, um, that, that people are driving more electric cars, that, um, that we've got a different way we've got to look at things. So we've got to um, put several things on the, on the table. And uh, I think that, that we've got to, first of all, know what our priorities are. We've got to um, look at the possibility of of uh, um, taking the, finding the waste that exists already and um, finding ways to, to pay for other things by, by identifying that waste. Um, and we've got to, um, to uh, look at uh, the tax, the tax uh, code that we have now and how we can improve it, make it fairer, uh, make sure that uh, middle class working families are, are, are shouldering less of the burden um, so that we can get this economy going in a way that, that gives us the kinds of um, revenue that can pay for these infrastructure projects. And back to Senator Miller Meeks on this. Do you have any specifics on that? On which part? Well, <laughs> on, when, when on, it comes on, to on, trying to cover the cost of this, trying to pay for yeah. this. As I said before, I think if you have a bipartisan uh, consensus come forward uh, so that both parties aren't attacking the other party, when you discuss what do you do with the fuel tax and on the federal level, uh, do you have uh, added uh, cost for electric vehicles? Uh, do you have a better permitting process and more local control so that we know that rural roads and bridges are being addressed in a manner that's best for that state? So I do think there are things that you can do in that regard, but I really think that this is gonna take a bipartisan consensus going forward, and it needs to be a multi-year uh, uh, project, not one or two years because our, uh, our roads and our builders can't um, you know, they can't plan ahead when you only have a one or two year funding. It needs to be a long term multi year funding infrastructure bill. Thank you, Senator. Now, looking towards Social Security, this came up again in the first debate. Second district, like so many districts here in Iowa, plenty of retirees. People rely on Social Security. Senator Hart, you said in the last debate that raising the age limit is not the way to go. I'll ask what the right way to go is, but first, the question for Senator Miller Meeks. You talked about how the level of taxation un unfairly penalizes the self employed, but also, if you would, could you talk about the workers who do have a boss and do work for a company and their levels of taxation for this? How would you put out a plan to try to keep Social Security solvent for decades? Well, we have had bipartisan. Um, um groups come together before in order to address uh, issues such as Social Security. I think it happened under Ronald Reagan. And I think it's going to take that again uh, because it then becomes a political attack for everybody running for office. Um, but we do need to have look at what are the ways that we can make sure that Social Security lasts. Young people are concerned that there will be no Social Security for them. This is a program that we pay into. Um, it's not an entitlement. It's paid into and people are getting a return for what they paid into. So I think looking at uh, as a bipartisan uh, consensus, if you raise taxes on those that are small businesses, it's small businesses that grow and become large businesses and employ people. And if you're a small business owner, which I was, you're paying 15.4%. So you have all of the rest of your overhead and then the taxation because you pay both the employer and the employee. So small businesses are unfairly penalized under that system. We already have an automatic increase in the salary. So the income level increases each year the amount that's taxed. So that's increasing and then we had additional taxes 
on higher income earners to fund Medicare. And I know that's not Social Security, but uh, there have been additional taxes uh, levied in order to uh, fund these programs. And we're at time now. Senator Hartz, when I asked about, you said in the last debate, raising the age limit is not the way to go. What would you do to keep Social Security viable? Critical issue. So yeah, I, I totally agree that we have got to make sure that this program exists um, for the seniors who are depending upon it. It's so crucial to our economy that, that people have a secure retirement. Um, and these are earned benefits that need to be, that, that promise needs to be kept for them. And we want this for our children and our grandchildren. So I'm glad to hear that, um, that we have a, a, a mutual desire here to do things in a bipartisan way. But we can't do that when, we're, um, when, when there are certain things that just simply don't make sense for um, the fix. And so raising the retirement age, I think, or privatization schemes, I don't think are appropriate. I do think that, uh, that people on both sides of the aisle would um, consider raising the cap um, in order to uh, make sure that we, have, that we fix this system so that it's a solvent going into the future. Thank you, Senator. James. Coming back to you, uh, Senator Hart, something you touched on in an earlier answer, talking about uh, water quality and, and agriculture. And Iowa farmers uh, count on a variety of federal programs to support them and protect them from market volatility. And should participation in those programs be uh, linked to water and soil conservation practices, perhaps sort of a, a, a good driver discount for farmers who plant cover crops and, and take uh, special care of waterways. Such an important issue that, um, that, that so many of us are really um, hungry to get to work on, right? Um, this is uh, something that, that, that people have been working on for generations. You know, I grew up on a, on a, on a dairy farm and my, my dad was a conservationist and he talked to me all the time about the ingenuity of the American farmer, um, that they're part inventor, part um, uh, engineer, and all hard work. If we can unleash the American ingenuity by the American farmer to actually put these uh, practices into place, I think that we can solve these problems. And so yes, we used to have a farm bill that was linked to some of these conservation efforts. What we need to do is make sure that farmers are the ones who are at the, at the center of making these decisions so that they make sense for, for farmers. And because not every farm is the same and not every area of the country is the same, geography is different. So we need to make sure that farmers are the ones who are um, leading this, uh, this charge, but we need to unleash their ingenuity to get that job done. Senator Miller-Meeks, should, should farm programs be tied to good practices uh, on the farm uh, to care for water and soil conservation? Well, I certainly think that that's a way to move behavior uh, into an area in which you want it to go. And so we've seen that work with other types of programs. You know, I've had the pleasure of uh, uh, going to the uh, Horace Farm uh, that uses cover crops and some of these practices, and they discuss uh, the feasibility of doing it uh, and the programs and being able to, uh, to be a sustaining program that can pay for itself. Uh, because it is, there is a cost to that uh, individual farmer when they adopt these programs. And so, yes, I think that there are incentives that can help navigate, but the more farmers that do it, um, and they, farmers are uh, ingenious, they're hardworking, they have a work ethic uh, and a never stop attitude. They're also the, some of the most hopeful people that I've ever met. Uh, and I think with that attitude that um, if you bring farmers to the table, they'll be able to help us to navigate through these issues and water quality as we've seen them come together to do uh, with Secretary Mike Nag. And we're gonna stick with farming at least to some degree here, talking about trade and especially trade with China. Uh, Senator Miller Meeks, there, there's a consensus that China has been a bad actor uh, when it comes to trade and respecting intellectual property. At the same time, it's one of the biggest markets for Iowa farmers and manufacturers. Um, how should the United States go about uh, expanding trade with China, even as it disrespects human rights and engages in military expansion in, in the South Pacific? Well, I think China's aggressions uh, have been of tremendous concern, uh, but uh, administration after administration, both parties, uh, has been really um, wary to do anything about China because they are such a large trading partner. But we know that they have egregious practices. They have not uh, acted in good faith uh, once admitted to the World Trade Organization, and they haven't obeyed the rules. So we're in a situation now where they're a trading partner with us. We want to continue to uh, negotiate those trade agreements. We had the phase one China deal, which we want to see go through. It's very important to our markets. Um, and it, uh, from that standpoint, for the agricultural markets, it's a very important trading partner for us. But there are ways that you can work with uh, 
uh, other international organizations and other countries in order to hold the Chinese Communist Party um, uh, accountable for their behavior, the theft of intellectual property, uh, the um, you know holding uh, companies hostages to be able to sell in their marketplace to turn over their technology to the Chinese Communist Party. These are things that have to be addressed and can be addressed, as I said, in uh, collaboration with other countries and with our international organizations, such as the World Trade Organization, the World Health Organization, Interta International Monetary Fund. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Senator Hart, what should our policy towards China be? given the situations that we're seeing there in terms of how they treat their minority, uh, minorities and their military expansion. Sure, I, I would agree with much of what I've heard here that, you know, um, we've got to align ourselves with other countries so that we come from a position of strength. And um, yeah, it's clear we're, we're all unhappy with China as a bad actor. Um, and that's why it's really frustrating that we went into this trade war um, from a um, singular factor instead of creating an alliance with other countries. And so now we've gone for almost four years um, and farmers have suffered as a result. And so we've, we've got to um, re-engage with uh, diplomatic uh, relations, here, relations here and we've got to do this from a position of strength. So al aligning ourselves with other countries with similar um, concerns and, um, and again, um, so many of our uh, farmers that are in engaged in, in this uh, trade um, kind of situation, they understand how to do this, um, where their advantages are. They need to be um, a crucial part of uh, that whole conversation. But we've got to come from a position of strength. May I? Oh, please. So, I, um, you know, when we're uh, dealing with these issues of trade, America had to be a leader on this. Other countries were not willing to come forward because China is such uh, a tremendous trading partner for us. So I think when, it, when the United States took action, uh, other countries were uh, willing to come along. And so now you see other countries that are willing to uh, assert uh, some authority through the World Trade Organization with China when it comes to theft of intellectual property, uh, uh, dumping uh, products uh, on the market and unfair trade practices. So I think the United States being a leader has helped other countries to come along. I think that United States being a leader in not doing this very well has probably caused other countries to say, hey, we ought to go about this a little bit differently. I would, I would disagree with that. And farmers wanted China to be taken on for decades. They've told me this. Question on civility and politics, kind of a broad reaching question. How crucial do both of you see this? We've seen many other debates from the highest levels uh, to congressional debates that can delve into personal attacks. Your first debate that was on Iowa PBS was very civil, very much kept to a lot of the topics. How do you, each of you try to bring this to Washington to be able to work, even if the other 400 plus members of the House know coming in where you might stand on most of the issues? Senator Hart, we'll start with you on this. Yeah, so I, I get this question a lot because people are very unhappy with the division in the country, right? They're tired of the name calling. They're tired of not getting along with their friends and families because, because of the political divide. And so I tell them that we, we all have to do our part. And so um, as leaders, as uh, people in elected position, we've got to be the example. We've got to show people that um, we can disagree with people and do it from a position of respect. And I tell people that e every one of us has to do that in every relationship we have. If we want to see this change, we've got to be the change that we want to see. And I think, uh, um, I, I, again, I've talked before about how I came from a divided household of a Republican mother and a Democratic father. That's where you learn that you can have big disagreements at a, at a, in a conversation. But the, in the end, you've got to get up from that table and work with everybody to get the work done. And so we have to lead by example. Um, we have to encourage others to do the same. We can get there if we all do our part. And Senator Miller Meeks, what would your approach be for this to try to keep the civility and keeping it to the issues? Because we've seen all these debates for the past three weeks, uh, present company excluded. <laughs> Thank you for that. And, um, you know, I follow the golden rule treat other people how you want to be treated. So when I went into the Senate, um, I uh, treated my colleagues with respect and dignity. Um, I was um, very fortunate to be given the leeway from my leadership uh, as chair of human services that if there was a bill that made good health policy sense, it didn't matter who authored it, that if I thought it made good health policy sense, that I, uh, I should uh, go ahead and, and pass that. So there were Republican bills, there were Democrat bills. We did multiple bills in a bipartisan way. And I think if you treat people with respect, 
with courtesy and dignity. Um, you don't always get it in return, but it's incumbent upon you and your response to how you're treated is going to set the tone for that. So I follow the golden rule. James. Senator Miller Meeks, Green New Deal or no Green Deal, what should Congress do to protect the environment, uh, limit harmful emissions, but without crippling farming or uh, our diets as we know them? Where do we begin? I think that's a great question and that's truly the question is, you know, how do we keep an economy growing, uh, which we know that we need an economy to grow so that uh, we have the tax revenue we need to help people in the way that uh, we need to help them and that for, for which they're asking. And so how do you do that and also protect the environment? In our state, we have a great example of that. We have 40% of our energy sources are from renewable, whether it's wind, solar, biodiesel, ethanol, and even ethanol uh, has gotten uh, better marks on being more environmentally friendly uh, in the recent years. And I think we can continue to do that. So we can continue to have research and development uh, as we look for cleaner sources of energy, as we change our uh, vehicles. I've had a Honda Civic Hybrid. It was a 2003, but had great gas mileage, um, but also had a hybrid electric, uh, electric engine. Um, we also have great uh, farm agriculture here and some great geniuses in our state that have worked on biochar and carbon sequestration and funding at Iowa State University. So continuing to do research and development as we look for this. I had a, a great opportunity to tour the... Um, we are at time right now on this one, Senator. Thanks. Senator Hart. Senator Hart. Green New Deal, I mean, members of your party have championed that idea. Is that something that you can uh, support if you get to Congress? I, I come from a very practical aspect on this, right? Um, again, um, with my farm background, I recognize that there's, there's so many things that we can do as farmers. And yes, to that point, we're lucky we live in Iowa that we have Iowa State and the University of Iowa and the Iowa Flood Foundation and the Leopold Center, they have done the research. We know the practices that, that, that are effective here. And many of our farmers have been doing these things um, and, and doing them on their own. But we need to have farm policy that weds itself to this research and um, allows um, an opportunity to really get things done. You know, one year when, I didn't, when we didn't get things done on a water quality bill in the Senate, I hosted a water quality summit locally so that we could have those kinds of conversations, bring the experts to the table, bring the urban people and the rural people together and really talk about what would make a difference. And, and what came out of that was that uh, rural people said, hey, you know, I could do more than I'm doing. And I'm really wanted to know about, I want to know more about this practice. And the urban people came out and said, you know, it's not as easy as I thought it was going to be. We've got to wed these things together and we've got to work together to get it done. Quick, quick follow up uh, to each of you and basically just yes or no on this. Um, should the federal government follow California's lead and set a goal for doing away with fossil fuel vehicles? Senator Miller Meeks? No. No? We need a strategic plan. We know where we are now and where we need to get. And we need to have a strategic that's plan a yes. to, get us, to get us there. If, if, the, if the positions are, if that's where it leads us so that we can do something about the carbon in the air it and do like something about right climate change. Right. <laughs> it has to be done right. It has to be done correctly. Let me just bring up now, uh, for, uh, let's assume each of you gets elected. We'll go from this point of view. Oftentimes, people who are in Congress for the first term say there's not much you can do right away. But specifically, we'll start with Senator Hart. What specifically would you want to focus on your first six months in office for the second district? What would you advocate for? What would you push for specifically? I hope that the first bill that I can vote on is a bill that is an anti-corruption bill. If this is another thing that people talk to me about and that I feel strongly about, that we have got to create a system that people have faith in. And right now, people don't um, believe that, that people in public office are there for the right reasons. They feel like they are there for their own, their own gain rather than doing the things for, for everyone else. And so I'd like to see um, us pass a, an anti-corruption bill that, um, that stops gerrymandering so that people feel like their vote counts again, that, that bans um, Congress people from ever serving as lobbyists, that bans Congress people from ever having, um, in, buying individual stocks, um, that um, attacks campaign finance reform. We have got to make, do a better job so that people have more faith in the system. And now, Senator Miller Meeks, as you focus on going to Washington, D.C., if you went for those first six months, what would you really advocate for? What would you put your time and efforts towards? You have up to a minute 20. 
So uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, how we recover through this, how we prepare for the next pandemic. We know that we'll have one. I predicted that we would have another one uh, and we need to address our strategic stockpile. We need to address manufacturing uh, from China and not having a single source for PPE. Uh, P or PPE and uh, pharmaceuticals, and so bringing that back into this country. So I think addressing the COVID-19 pandemic going uh, as it is currently and going forward and then healthcare. The next thing is an infrastructure bill. I think it's very important for us to be able to grow our economy and to grow as our state. And also uh, there have been so many jobs that have been lost and businesses that may never come back from this pandemic that were involuntarily shut down uh, by the government that may be an uh, avenue for job creation. Um, we know that we have uh, roads, bridges, locks, dams, broadband. Uh, we know we have in infrastructure that needs to be repaired. Uh, uh, add the derecho into that as well too. Uh, so we know that this is something that we can work on and we can work on in a bipartisan fashion. And then trust in government and accountability. Um, I think it's very important. We need to have more transparency uh, in all of our agencies, uh, more uh, accessibility for our citizens to be able to address their elected leaders and to address heads of agencies so that we have uh, restore uh, faith and trust in our government agencies. Thank, I'm just going to jump in here before James asks his final question for closing statements. We're going to give you guys 30 seconds for James' question. This is the TV news anchor. I mean, to make sure we get out of here on time. So <laughs> please go for it, James. All right. Dr. Miller Meeks, Senator Miller Meeks, um, we're being told there will be tens of millions of doses of COVID 19 vaccine available by the end of the year. Will you get the vaccine? Yes. Should it be mandatory? Yes, I'll get the vaccine. No, it shouldn't be mandatory. Senator Rita Hart. If it's, if it's been cleared by the, the health experts, absolutely, we should all be we, we should all be front and center. And and yes, there should be a mandate. And if we're going to keep people safe, we've got to make it happen. Thank you. Okay, a couple more questions before we do get to those closing arguments because we have a little bit more time. Senator Hart, do you have any thoughts on should term limits be coming into place in Congress or Supreme Court? Are you still good with lifetime appointments? Uh, what I would like to see us do is to, um, again, fix the system so that people feel like they can, um, they can vote when they, they can keep a, a, a person accountable who is their elected representative. So if we can uh, do something about the gerrymandering and about campaign finance reform, we'll find a, an opportunity to hold our, our elected officials accountable. That's, I think, the better solution. Okay, and 30 seconds for you on this, Senator Miller Meeks. Any thoughts on term limits for Congress or lifetime appointments still on the high courts? Well, it's certainly hard to run against an incumbent. I know that very well. Um, but having said that, there are term limits at the ballot box. And what happens when you limit your congressional representatives is that uh, the uh, power within the bureaucracy increases. So one of my favorite senators was Senator Tom Coburn from Oklahoma. He also happened to be a physician, and he term limited himself. He said he would so serve no more than eight years as uh, a representative, and he did that was back in Oklahoma, and then he was asked to run four years later for the uh, Senate seat. He ran for the Senate seat, and then in his second term as a senator, stepped down uh, and resigned. And he recently uh, passed away from prostate cancer. Uh, as far as the Supreme Court, I think at this time, uh, yes, I would continue to agree with lifetime appointments. Um, but I would also like to we see- We do have to wrap this up so, you got, so both of you can get your last words in. So we will do this. You get 60 seconds each to make a final pitch for those of us who've joined us. Senator Miller Meeks, you have the floor. Well, you know, being a 24-year uh, military veteran and a doctor and a former director of public health isn't what makes me the best candidate for this seat. What makes me the best candidate is that I'm a person who listens and not only listens with their ears, but with their heart and with their brain and is moved to action by the things they hear. And my life story will tell you that I never quit fighting and I never give up. And I will never quit fighting for the people of Iowa, for their futures and the future of our great state. I will continue to work hard to be your voice in Congress and to make sure that all of us can reach and fulfill our potentials. And Senator Hart. So thank you so much for the opportunity to be here tonight. I really appreciate that. Um, we have talked a little bit about health care tonight, and uh, that's a, an issue that, that is personal to everyone. Everyone I talk to has a personal story. And my personal story has to do with my mother, who had a heart condition that caused her to lose her voice. And so she raised nine children with just a whisper. And, and I raised my five children, and I think back on that, and I think, how did she raise nine children successfully with just a whisper of a voice? But I know the answer. And the answer is that she taught us how to listen, because we needed to listen. Sometimes she was in trouble. We also needed to listen in order to know if she was happy or sad or mad. And the other lesson that I learned 
is that sometimes the loud voices are not always the ones that you ought to listen to. That sometimes that less powerful voice, the voice that you have to lean in to hear, is the one that, can, that has the most important thing to say to you that can really make the biggest difference in your life. I think Washington has forgotten that lesson. I will never forget it. I'd be honored to have your vote. And thanks to both of you. We are out of time here for the debates here for the second congressional district. Of course, the 24 counties covering much of southeast Iowa from Ottumwa to Iowa City to Clinton County and the Quad Cities. And our sister station, KWQC and the Quad Cities Times, will host the next debate one week from tonight in conjunction with this one. And they will touch on some of the topics we didn't get to. We've already agreed to this. So education, some of the other topics, you will both handle this for that. So, of course, we'd like to thank Senator Rita Hart and Senator Marionette Miller-Meeks and James Lynch from the Cedar Rapids Gazette. Thank you as well. And thanks to all of you for watching us for this presentation. It's always important to try to be informed, and we hope that uh, you were able to pick up something about each of these two candidates. Make it a great night, and we appreciate your time.